Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm aware that I'm taking up what was a coffee break, um, so I'll try and be as stimulating as a cup of coffee. Uh, and I'm also aware that uh, I'm standing in the way of the reception, so I'll try to be uh, on time. <coughs> so um, you've heard today uh, a little bit about remote sensing. You've heard a little bit about um, the overall kind of defence and security enterprise and the, the world of innovation. And I'm trying to bring those two things together a little bit to talk about um, uh, remote sensing and the future of remote sensing and um, how we might deal with this deluge of information which is coming our way or deluge of data. So um, you've probably heard of Airbus. Um, some of you might have flown here in an Airbus. Um, but some of you may not know that we also have um, a defence and security division of our business. Um, and uh, a big part of that is space. Um, in fact, we are the only uh, integrated satellite uh, manufacturer and data provider. So we build satellites, but we also provide data. So we sell data openly on the market. Um, and that means we've developed a lot of our own geospatial technology. Um, you may have heard of us originally. Uh, we were called Astrium a few years ago. And then before that, we were BAE. And you may also have heard of uh, InfoTerra, which was one of the precursor companies. Well, we're all branded as Airbus now. Um, and I think one of the most interesting facts that most people don't know is that about 80% of all the data on Google Earth comes from our satellites. Um, so if you look down the bottom, you'll see InfoTerra Limited, and that's, that's an Airbus company or an Airbus brand. Um, and we have one of the largest archives of satellite data available. Um, we've been archiving data since, uh, well, since 1986 there. Um, we've done a lot of archiving also for ESA missions, so European Space Agency missions, including the MVSAT and ERS missions. So our heritage goes back a long way. It goes back to the very early days of European Earth observation technology. Um, increasingly, Earth observation technology is being applied in the real world, and by that I mean the commercial world. And a great example of that is the fact that um, about 80% of British, ins British insurers now use flood models based on our data, and we sell that as a service to the insurers. So if you're um, trying to buy a house in the UK and, uh, and you get rated poorly, don't blame me. That's my colleagues. Um, <coughs> and um, we also sell our geodata solutions uh, around the world, so outside the UK, and we sell to more than 100 uh, countries. So we have a lot of customers. But that's the end of the advert. Um, and what I'd really like to talk to, talk to is um, the wider picture of Earth observation, particularly satellite-based Earth observation, but I'll talk a little bit about airborne as well. Um, so these two, these two plots, I think, really tell the whole story. This top plot, which you can just about read, um, shows um, the, the x-axis is time, starting in 2005 to 2025. And the y-axis um, is the terabytes of data generated by satellites every day. So these are, this is commercial Earth observation data um, that you can go and buy, or you get for free. So this includes the Copernicus uh, and Sentinel uh, missions. And we're about here. And you can see that uh, we're already beginning to see uh, a kind of... Uh, almost exponential rise in the amount of data that's coming from space. The red bars there show missions which are fully funded, um, and the green bars show missions which have yet to achieve full funding. Um, and here are the number of satellites. So today we're about uh, 220 satellites, um, and in 10 years' time we could be around, well, at least 800 satellites. So that's quite a big change, okay? Um, now, admittedly, a lot of these things will not, uh, may, may not actually fly. They may not get, get funding. But there's this huge trend now in, in, in the satellite industry that the amount of data is, is just becoming uh, almost incomprehensible. Okay? So when I started years and years ago, we had access to MVSAT. Fantastic mission. Generated a lot of data every day. But quite frankly, one person could sit down and process the data from one of those instruments um, and, and really understand it. You can't do that with 800 uh, satellites. You really need to have an automated production line. Um, so some of the facts, some of the things that, that will happen if uh, this investment um, really, really um, comes through is that every part of the Earth will be imaged uh, at least every day 
and probably several times a day. In, so, in fact, um, one of these companies that comes into this intends to image the Earth, the whole Earth, every hour. Now, that's quite phenomenal. Can you believe that? You'll go online, you'll go to a website, and you'll see your house every hour, or any part of the globe. You'll have to pay for it, of course, but that's quite impressive. And imagine what you can do with that data. Um, not only will they be imaging, or well, the industry will be imaging in optical um, uh, imagery, so it will also be um, using high-resolution synthetic aperture radar. So it will work at night. You'll get one metre resolution data at night, potentially anywhere in the world, online, whenever you want it. Um, <coughs> VHR data, so very high-resolution data, um, so almost... Um, uh, aerial imagery quality um, will also become very commonly available from satellites. Um, so again, a complete change from the kind of one meter imagery or even several meter imagery we, we were talking about several years ago. And one of the things most, uh, uh, many people are really excited about is full motion video. So today there are a couple of satellites, um, so technology demonstrator satellites, one of which we've launched, um, which will generate high resolution um, almost HD quality video from space that you can download. And it will do it in short sequences today, um, maybe a few minutes. Um, but already we're beginning to see the value of that data. So we can see planes moving, cars, that kind of thing. Um, of course, as this technology progresses, there become some privacy concerns and things like that. Um, and that's a whole kind of area of regulation, which certainly a lot of people are thinking about today. Um, and... Some of these companies are, are moving beyond just optical or radar imagery for surveillance. They're also um, getting into the meteorological market. So there are a couple of companies today which want to supply commercial me uh, me meteo data. So most people in the UK will go to the Met Office for their Met data in France. It will be Meteo France. There's actually a whole uh, bunch of commercial providers out there providing weather service data. In fact, the BBC has just switched to a commercial um, weather provider. And there's a huge opportunity for, for these commercial companies um, to, to generate their own data, which they can get more cheaply than they can get from the Met Office or from, um, from Copernicus and these kinds of things. So um, that's uh, almost certainly going to happen. And also, um, uh, Steve talked about hyperspectral data. Many of these companies are also talking about having regular hyperspectral data available from space. So there's a huge, huge amount of data that's going to come in in the next 10 years. The question is, how can we make that meaningful? Okay. So we're playing our part um, in supplying this data. Um, so uh, here are some of the satellites. I, I couldn't avoid putting a few satellites on, on, on the presentation. Um, so we, we've got uh, an optical sat uh, two optical satellites called Pleiad, which have 0.7 meter uh, resolution, and they're in the optical. We've got uh, satellites called Spot, which have 1.5 meters with six meter multispectral. We also have um, radar satellites, so a high resolution radar satellite and low cost satellites, and we also build satellites for a whole bunch of other people. So we've built about 150 satellites. It's a good time to be a satellite manufacturer. Um, but one of the real sea changes we find is that the cost of these satellites is coming down. So we, I think um, it was mentioned earlier today that um, the performance of platforms, and the discussion earlier today was specifically about air platforms, but it applies to satellites as well, that the performance of the hardware is now getting to the point where it's kind of levelling off a little bit. Um, we're getting to the physical limit. So what we're doing now is lowering the cost of those satellites. And um, when you lower the cost of the satellites, that enables you to have more of them. When you've got more satellites, you can have what, what's called constellations of satellites. Um, so um, when you have a constellation of satellites, you can have higher revisit time. And that's what enables you to have hourly, um, hourly imagery. Right? You need to have hundreds of satellites to do that. And they need to be very cheap. And that's really what's making the difference um, in this exponential rise in performance or, or in you know, data. Um, so two of the, the, the most recent technology developments that we've been working on, uh, one is an X-band radar mission called Novasar X, um, which is a follow-on from an S-band radar mission which will fly in, um, in, uh, in January. 
or launch in January. This, this is basically is an X-band radar that will give us one metre quality resolution at very low cost, which means we could have a very large constellation of these small satellites. Um, and we've also just launched a, a mission called Carbonite, and we've got another mission called Carbonite 2 coming up in, um, in January, which will launch with Novasat S. Um, and this can provide 1.4 metre or even sub-metre um, uh, video from space. So this is the kind of mission that gives you the, um, those short video sequences that I mentioned. But it's also capable of delivering that, that data, so that imagery, directly to a user on the ground. So you don't have to wait for it to come round uh, on the orbit to a downlink station. It can deliver it directly into, into a theatre. Um, and that, at least in a defence and security environment, gives a tremendous capability because it means that somebody on the ground can essentially request a video sequence of their whole area, maybe a 10-kilometre by 10-kilometre area, and then they can get that video imagery anywhere in the world um, within, within an hour, essentially. So it's quite a powerful quite a powerful technique and quite a powerful tool for people to use. But again, it's all about having more data. We just get more and more data. Coming into this mix, um, and it was mentioned again earlier, was Zephyr. So um, we're developing a high-altitude platform called Zephyr. Um, it was originally developed by Kinetic, and we bought the, the, whole, uh, the whole operation in Farnborough. <coughs> Zephyr is, is an air aircraft, but we call it a pseudo-satellite because it operates at 20 kilometres altitude. That's high in the stratosphere, which means it can fly um, above the weather. Um, it's solar-powered, which means that it can last for days, weeks on end. And we've sold three of them to the MOD, and they'll be operating them next year and doing trials. Um, but operating at 20 kilometres is quite different to operating at 700 kilometres. Um, Zephyr gives you all basically um, permanent visibility. It gives you persistence at a height that enables you to have very good ground resolution, so you know, sub-10 ten, sub, sub ten centimetre um, ground resolution. Um, so we envisage that, that, that things like Zephyr will be producing lots more data, which will only make this data problem worse, you know, that exponential uh, rise in the amount of data. Once you start mixing in these kind of pseudo-satellites, um, uh, we'll, only, we'll only get worse. And we're looking at how we can integrate Zep uh, missions like Zephyr and technologies like Zephyr with satellites so we can fuse that data together. Um, even, even worse than that, so we've got all this data that's coming from, from airborne, it's coming from satellites. Even worse is the fact that most of this data is, m is not that useful on its own. You need to fuse it with something else. Um, so a lot of companies now are talking about fusing Earth observation data with ground-based data, for example. In the intelligence domain, a lot of people are talking about fusing uh, Earth observation data with uh, things like Twitter reports or Facebook reports. So, for example, um, uh, in the Arab Spring, for example, there was a huge explosion of Twitter uh, reports in, in a particular area. You could use that to trigger a satellite to come over and take imagery of that area because something interesting is going on. Um, and you can imagine combining that data in all sorts of other ways. In the agricultural domain, for example, Steve mentioned uh, fusing potentially rover data, so in situ data with UAVs um, and uh, meteorological data, for example. But the problem is there's a huge amount of data out there that you could, you could go and fuse Earth observation data with. You know, some of these companies are talking about um, fusing EO data with almost arbitrary data sources. That's incredibly hard. Okay? So this shows that EO data perhaps generates today about 100 terabytes per day. All the other data sources in the world generate about 4 million terabytes per day. So that's quite a processing challenge. You know, if you really, really want to go out there and start fusing all this data together, you've got a really big problem on your hands. Because ultimately, most people don't, they don't really care about this stuff up here. They don't care about the data source. What they care about is this stuff down here, which is the information, the knowledge, and you know, dare I say it, the wisdom. So if you've done a data science degree, um, at the top of the pyramid, you start with data at the bottom, you end up with wisdom at the top. And I'd rephrase that slightly. Actually, most people want answers. And that used to be the case in intelligence. Somebody would say, I need this question answered. Go and get it for me. And the intelligence would go and get that. They would write a report and they'd come back. They can't do that now. 
it's much, much harder because the amount of data is so, so big, it needs to become automated. But if you're going to find an answer, you need to know what the question is. And that's the one challenge today, is that nobody knows really how you're going to use this data. So, for example, this is what you could have. In the future, you could have a bank of screens giving you the whole world in real time, or near real time. Okay, so maybe a few minutes after. So, you know, these things are going to come, these imagery, images are going to come every hour of the whole world. Um, is that going to be analysed by a human, poor human being sitting there? Watching a huge bank of screens like a CCTV control centre? Well, they're going to need a lot of coffee, obviously. And the Americans tried to do this. They tried to do it with predator drones, you know, tried to do it with UAVs. Um, they just can't get human beings to do it. It's just not... It's really, really hard. They, they have to train these, these people, um, and they're incredibly valuable, and they're just not enough of them. So imagine scaling that up. It's not a scalable process. So... The two, the two things that are really needed here is one is simplified access. We need to find a way to give people access to this data in a really easy to manage way. But we need to automate the imagery processing. We need to, to basically pick out the key features, the salient details, and just focus on, on that stuff. Um, and that's the only way we'll get value from this huge amount of data that's coming. So, um, we, so we, we obviously, we've been doing some work on that. So we've got a suite of products um, that, let's say, are in development. Some of these are available today. But um, a couple of quite nice ones which I thought I'd highlight today is, is one called uh, Street Factory, um, and which is based on a product called Pixel Factory. So this is a, uh, an automated production line for producing imagery. So we, can, we ingest data from the satellites, and what it spits out at the end of the day is it can either spit out maps, uh, terrain models, and 3D models, and I thought this was quite nice. So this is a um, 3D model of uh, Marseille, the whole town of Marseille. This is only a small part of Marseille, uh, but actually it generates the whole, um, a 3D model of the whole town of Marseille, and it can do that every time the satellite comes over. So that's a lot of processing, um, but it means you can get a really up-to-date um, uh, uh, 3D model of Marseille or any town that you can then go and interrogate, and you can fly around and you can look for changes. Um, another thing we're looking at is to um, improve the user experience is delivery into things like mobile phones, so apps, um, which is uh, very interesting if you're in certain parts of the world if you want to get data really in real time. Um, but the key thing there is that we need to deliver the right data at the right time. So this um, just shows some automated processing that's been done to identify planes. And each of these circles represents a certain type of plane. Um, so this, this, this app that's been developed means somebody can um, request an image, the data will come back, it will classify what's in the image, so it will say there are these types of planes, and then you can identify, for example, the planes which are um, unusual. So actually there was, an, uh, there was a, I think that was a helicopter actually, um, in that image. And so, you know, quite quickly, the, um, the user can say, oh, there's something odd there, something I don't understand. So they can really drill down to the, um, to the, to the question they're trying to answer. Um, a big part of this is automated change detection. So I think this was mentioned earlier. This is um, some change detection and classification that was done on an airstrip. So this, this shows... Um, the amount of change between two images. So I think this is, uh, uh, yeah, so this is, this is over the course of about a month. Um, so this is the two images there. And then this is the, oh dear, hopefully that's not going to die. Um, and so this shows the, um, uh, the amount of change between the two images. And it really means that um, the analysts can go and say, well, what is that change? And the interesting thing is in this process is it's also able to classify that type of change. Is it a new building? Is it the earth that's moved? Is it a new runway, for example? Um, so again, it enables users to, to focus in on the, um, on, on the real question. Here's another example of flooding extents. So this is an analysis that was done of flooding extent. And um, this is another analysis that was an automated analysis that was done of an industrial accident. Um, and the software was able to correctly identify where the fires were and which buildings had collapsed. Now, of course, that's really useful for producing reports that can then go to the people who are going to go and help um, and, and, and uh, you know, the fire services and so on. 
So it's really generating something useful um, for these users. This is another example of um, classifying traffic. So this is from a single, actually it's quite an interesting example of a single image, um, but from the single image and the spectral data in that image, they, um, the software is able to correctly identify all the moving cars and the speed which those cars are moving at. Um, so from that, it's possible, for example, to um, uh, derive applications for urban planning, for example. You could also identify if traffic has stopped for whatever reason and, and where it stopped. And finally, I um, just wanted to, to show you some, some uh, quite interesting imagery from, um, from satellites we've got called Playad. Um, and this shows the, 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 the kind of power of change monitoring. Um, and this is what's available today. It's not what's available tomorrow. What's available tomorrow will be much more sophisticated than, than this. The key thing is that this is take, these are images which are taken every day. Um, as I mentioned, in the future, this will be taken maybe every hour, for example. So this is monitoring Suez Harbour. This is the, the overall extent of the imagery that was taken, so it takes all of Suez, and we're focusing just on this red square here. Um, and what I'll do is just cycle through these images. So this is the first day. It shows, um, shows all the boats and the buildings and the cars. Um, I mean, for a start, it's interesting because you can see the quality of the imagery. So Steve talked about the atmospheric correction. Well, this has been fully atmospherically corrected. Um, so this is, this is more or less what you would see if you were located a few kilometers above the, the surface. Um, now, if I scroll through this, you can see um, the changes in movement. So you can see boats that have come and gone. You can also see, uh, where is it? Here, for example, you can see um, the... Uh, a boat that's being t towed into the surf into the side. Uh, my battery's just died, but never mind. Um, but I think what that really shows is that um, this kind of inter interday um, monitoring, which is possible today, really enables you to observe objects and it enables you to observe um, uh, the, what's actually happening on on the ground. But more than that. The amount of data that's going to come is going to be far in excess of that in the future. And so all of these automated techniques that we're developing and other people are developing are going to be absolutely key for um, deriving the kind of answers to the questions that people are going to ask. But I'll come back to that original point. But actually today, we don't necessarily even know what the questions are. It sounds odd. If, if you're in the intelligence domain, you probably do know what some of those questions are. But I think, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the intelligence domain, the MOD, the, the defense, are probably not going to be the biggest users of this kind of technology in the future. It will be the commercial domain. And people are only really beginning to understand the value of this kind of information in the commercial domain. So whatever we're developing, it has to be very flexible, it has to be very, mo be, be very modular, and it has to be very easy to use in order to improve the, or enable people to take it up. That's something we're working on, but it's also something a lot, a lot of other, lots of other players are working on in the UK. Um, and um, a good example of that is the Copernicus program, which is encouraging the use of, use of Earth observation data. There's now um, three Copernicus satellites um, orbiting the Earth, generating data every day. That has enabled um, the EU, essentially, to um, stimulate the take-up of downstream services um, through innovative calls for SMEs, for example, and uh, for academics. So it's about creating an end-to-end -end supply chain for using this kind of data. And um, essentially, the sky's the limit. This kind of data is going to get more, it's going to get more complicated, and hopefully it will become higher value in the future. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.